y'all would tonight, open your Bibles with me to the 22nd chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 22. And we're going to be reading the first verse together, as usual, when you find your place. Stand along with reverence reading, reading of God's holy word, and if you would, read this verse aloud with me. Proverbs chapter 22. And verse number one says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Let's read that one more time. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, Father, for this time that we have together. Thank you for the wonderful day that we've had here in your house. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of Christ that has been uh, shown throughout this church, Lord. Thank you for all those that are in attendance this evening. Father, I just pray that you would just remove me from this message that you've given me to preach, Lord. May I simply be the vessel for whom you speak. Lord, may your word and your will alone be communicated uh, to the ears and the hearts and the lives of those that are present here this evening and those who will hear this message. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us will give you our complete and undivided attention, Lord. May we have a spirit of godliness uh, within our hearts, Father. And may we be receptive to your word, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray that your will will be done throughout the service, Lord. Show us the things that we need to see. Teach us what we need to know, Lord, so that we can be who it is that you need us to be. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now this verse here, excuse me just one second. I got a little more echo in me. Now this verse here that we just read uh, is a, a fairly well-known proverb, and there's a lot of truth to it, because it says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and love and favor rather than silver and gold. Now, I want to pay particular attention to the first half of this verse, where it says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Now, what superficially, what is this talking about? What is this talking about to us when we read this? A good name. What is that? Honesty. Honesty? What else might it be? Uh, People know you as a good person. People know me as a good person. Hopefully they see Jesus Christ in your actions. And so it, it, can, it has a twofold application. It has a, 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 a temporal, uh, physical application with regard to our reputation and has a spiritual application with regard to our testimony. Amen. So it, it, what does it mean to be someone of good report? Okay, someone of good reputation. You know, it, when you think about business dealings, for example, and I know that Brother David's over there shaking his head, or nodding his head, rather. And when you're thinking, you probably shake your head, too, with some of the business <laughs> dealings you've had. When you're dealing with someone who is of a good report, who is of a good reputation, what is that experience generally going to be like? It's going to be an honest transaction. It's going to be a pleasant experience. Why? Because you're dealing with someone who is of a good report, has a good reputation, someone who you know. And let me ask you this. Would you be more likely to do business with someone that you just randomly look up and pick them out because of the first person in, in the phone book, if you still use a phone book, or the first person who comes up on a Google search in this day and time, or would you be more inclined to talk to your friends and family and ask them if there's someone they would recommend? Now, who is it that we recommend to other people? We recommend those people who are of a good report. It's either something we've heard from someone else who's had dealings with them, or it's from personal experiences that we've had in dealing with them. When, when I... Uh, when I had my oral surgery that I had, there were some that asked about a good oral surgeon. Boy, I recommended them left and right anytime I could to anybody who brought, the, brought that up. Why? Because I had a phenomenal experience uh, from start to finish. I mean, just impeccable service. Uh, took really good care of me. Just, I can't say a bad thing about it, and I thank God for him and for what God was able to do through him. So because of that, I'm uh, pleased to recommend this particular oral surgeon to someone who needs help. But, but... On the flip side of that, if someone were to ask me uh, some place to eat, and they would say, hey, I was thinking about going down to such and such restaurant. Whoa, 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 whoa. You mean the one that's down there by so-and-so's place or whatever? Yeah, oh boy. Now, 
If you want to go, go. But let me tell you about what happened when I went there. And how many times have we shared stories with one another? Well, I went there, and isn't it funny how you can sit a group of people down like us here, and not everybody has had a bad experience at the same place, and not everybody has had a good experience at the same place. Why? Because we're people dealing with other people. Okay, and because of that, my definition of a good steak may, in your mind, in your eyes, and your, by your taste buds, be a terrible steak. My definition, and let me just tell you, having started working in food service, that was my first job that I worked in, spent a few years in food service, I am, you can ask my wife, I am a stickler for a good service. And if someone gives me good service, I will tip them so much that my wife gets upset at me. <laughs> and if someone gives me bad service, I will not leave them a penny. Why? And you may say, well, Brother Steve, that's kind of mean. You should at least leave them a dollar or something like that. No, 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 no. See, understand something. They live by that money. It is not the money they get paid. They live by the tips. That's where the money is that pays the majority of those folks' income. So if you want to get a, a message across to someone that, hey, there is something here that is in need of attention, in need of repair, in need of modification, in need of, of, of bet bettering, I guess it would be an okay word for it, then I don't leave them a tip. Why? Because I let them know. And when I leave, if there's someone up there who's in management, or if it's bad enough, I'll ask to speak with the manager. And I'll just say, look, I'm not trying to get a free meal. I'm not trying to get any attention. This is just something I think you need to be aware of. And I'll share it with them, hoping that they're going to correct that. Why? Because I want that waiter or waitress to be good at what they're doing, to be able to make a good living at what they're doing, because if they're good, they're going to have a good experience working that job. The people they're serving will have a good experience receiving the service, and everybody wins, especially me. Next time I go in there, if that happens to be my waiter or waitress, if I go back in there again. So we can understand how the experiences are that we share. And, you know, it, it, it all comes down to personal preference, personal experience. My, if I were to ask what is the best Chinese food in town or in Johnson County, I would get different answers from different people. Best Mexican food in Johnson County, I would get different answers from different people. Okay, we all have the best burger in Johnson County. Once again, different answers from different people. And yes, one of these days, I'm going to go try the place in Grandview that has those fantastic burgers and the, the onion rings and all that. Blue Star. At, yeah, Blue Star. See, there you go. Best, some of the best burgers that there are, amen. So, and, and again, you may like McDonald's Happy Meal. Nope. I'm going to pray for you if that's the case. <laughs> but now, now, you know, there are certain things from there I like, but I'm not too many. You know, so again, it's personal preference, but it all comes down to the fact of if I'm looking for something, and if I'm looking to purchase a product online, which I do most all my shopping, with very few exceptions, not talking about food, but other items, I buy online. And the reason being is I can go and look at an item that I'm thinking about buying, and I can go and I can look at the reviews that other people who've bought it have to say. And what they're doing is they're either giving me their recommendation or they're telling me, go the other direction, don't want anything to do with it. And there's been a lot of things that look really good, the price looks really good, and I got into the reviews, and it's one star, one star, like a one out of five, or one star, fell apart within the first week. Uh, one star, the, you know, came on, on the scene came out, or the buttons popped off, talking about shoes and stuff, you know, just an example. The point is, is are we going to invest in something that other people are telling us is junk? No. Well, I mean, you may want to, but I would, I would advise against it. Common sense would tell us, go the other way. Why? We want to put our money and our investment into something that is quality, right? We want to invest in something that is of a good report, that is reputable. Now, what I want to talk about tonight with regard to this specific verse, now we were talking about you know, food, food experiences and restaurants, uh, products, things like that. But what we're going to take a look at tonight is us, okay? Not others, us. So right now, there is no one in this world that is more important than us right here in this room. And the reason I'm going to say that is this. Because I want you to get your eyes and your mind and your thoughts off of who else is in the world, and I want you to put them on you. <coughs> Not the person beside you, not the person in front or behind you. I want you to put your thoughts and your mind and your focus 
on you. Brother Steve, it's early in the message and you're already making me nervous. I hope and I pray to God that I am. Why? Because the whole point of a message, folks, is that if our toes don't get smushed a little bit, it served no purpose. That's right. We have to have the ability to allow God to show us something that we need to see about ourselves. Because if I leave here having preached a message that doesn't have you looking at yourself when you're leaving, I didn't do my job. And if you come in here and you are not looking at yourself when you're leaving in a, in a state of self-examination, then you aren't listening and you aren't looking for the blessing God has for you. Because right. I guarantee you, if you're here tonight, and if you're saved, and you're looking for a blessing, God has got the blessing for you here before we're all said and done. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you can get saved here tonight. This is the hour of salvation. You can leave here a born-again believer, and then every part of this message will apply to you. But this message here applies for those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, what we're talking about here is the story of your life. Has anybody ever heard that song, The Story of My Life? My, my wife's kind of chuckling over there. It was one of my, my grandmother, my grandfather's, my late grandfather. That was one of their, that was actually their song. Uh, I think, who was it? Neil Diamond, I think, sang that song. The Story of My Life, The Gins and Ends With You. And just a real sweet, just a love song. That was... That was my late grandfather and my grandmother's. That was their song, okay? And the thing that, that comes to mind with regard to that song is the fact that uh, as the song is, is going through and I'm hearing that tune in my head, is that there is a story that we all have to tell. So it all comes down to what is your story? What is it? What is your story? <laughs> but see, here's the thing. You already have. Now, now listen to what I'm talking about here. Our story that we tell has nothing to do with what comes out of our mouths. The story that you and I tell has to do with how we're living our lives. The story of my life has nothing to do with the words that I speak. I mean, you could say in a sense it does because we should have godly speech shouldn't use the words the world uses as far as the cussing and all those things. There's no argument there. I'm not making that argument. But what I am saying is this. I'm not as concerned about your words as I am about your life. Amen. And why? That's because God's not as concerned about your words as he is about your life. The reason being, if your life is right by the word of God, then those words will take care of themselves. Amen. So that's why the focus has to be on my life. And I want you to say that in your mind right now. The focus has to be on my life. One person said it best when they said, your life may very well be the only Bible that people ever read. Yes. And I want you to think about that. Think about it. Your life may very well be the only Bible that people will ever read. How can my life be a Bible? That doesn't make any sense. The Bible, I mean, what is the Bible? If you got your Bible tonight, hold it up for me. What is the Bible? The Bible is right there. God's holy word. If you don't have a Bible, you should get a Bible. You shouldn't go to church without a Bible. If you need a Bible, talk to us, and we'll make sure you get a Bible. Because we all need to have the word of God here. And if you're looking on with your, your husband and wife, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I try to do that with my wife, but she hogged the Bible, so I just bring my own. So... <laughs> So, or, or, you know, sometimes we've got our Bible here on, on the modern technological equipment that we have. But the point is, is, Brother Steve, how can I be a Bible? Well, there is a poem that I pulled an excerpt from. It goes like this. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by deeds that you do, by words that you say. Men read what you write. Whether faithless or true, say, what is the gospel according to you? What is the gospel according to you? Some call it the fifth gospel. Whatever you want to call it, it all comes down to this. You and I, in the lives that we're living, 
tell a story to the people who are around us. And that story is either something that is glorifying to God or it's not. It's one or the other. So we're going to take a look at three aspects of the story of your life. And when I'm saying your life, I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at us because it is a story of my life as well. Because if you're a born-again believer that is here tonight, say amen. 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 Okay, so we've got some born-again believers here in the house of God. So if you're a born-again believer, this message applies to you just as much as it does to me. Pastors, preachers, missionaries, evangelists, musicians, people in a position of church leadership are not held to any higher standard or lower standard than you are or I. God expects the same thing from all of us. He expects us all to live lives that are Christ-like. So, the story of your life, we're going to take a look at three different aspects. Okay, so the first part of this it's simply going to be how you live. How you live. Flip over to Romans chapter number 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 6. Verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then look down at verse number 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto your sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For, it sh for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, with regards to the story of your life, the story of my life, the first aspect of this story has to do with our lives, the way we're living, our lifestyle. Now, the reason why we read these verses here is because too often times we as Christians tend to forget that God, through the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ, has freed us from the bondage of sin. We're no longer held in bondage to sin. We're no longer... Uh, in a position where all we can do is sin, we, you and I at this point, let me just put it this way, here on this earth, you and I will never be more free from sin than we are now. Why? Because we are free, and we are free indeed. We're free from, a, from the clutches of sin, from the clutches of hell, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So because of that, what these verses are saying, how can we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? Now, what's the application here? Well, it's simple. How many sins that you lived with in your life before you got saved are still present in your life now that you've been saved? Amen. Amen. How many sins are still there that were there before? A good deal. Why? You and I are going to struggle with sin each and every day of our lives. But here's the thing. There is such a thing as living an open rebellion against God in the unconfessed sin, that iniquity that is in our lives. And what does the Word of God tell us? If I regard iniquity in my heart, He will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, He will not hear me. Now, that's not saying that if you sin during the day and if you sin and you struggle and you think something that you shouldn't think or say something that you shouldn't say that God isn't going to hear your prayer. No, that's not what that's saying. What it's saying is if you have unconfessed, open sin in your life that you see it, you know that it's there, you know that it shouldn't be there, you're okay with it being there, you don't plan on doing anything to keep it from being there, and yet you live your life as if everything's okay, then God is not going to hear you. 
Why? Because that sin acts as a barrier between your prayers and the ear of God through Jesus Christ. If we allow something to stay in our lives that we know should not be there, God will not hear our prayers. Wait a second, Brother Stephen, how come I'm okay? How come I, I still have money in the bank, food on the table, and all these things? You know, I, I don't know the passage right off the top of my head, but when um, my wife and I were doing Bible study together, there was a verse that the Lord allowed me to see that went right in with what I like to call proximity blessings. And what that is, is if you're not living for God, and someone else in your home is not living for God, but yet there's someone in your home who is living for God, God is going to bless your home for the sake of the one who is living for God. That's right. Why? The Bible says that the, that the Lord causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that God is not going to deprive you and me of our blessings based upon the lifestyles of those who we are around. Now, there is an exception to that. There's a difference between being in a home with a family and you can't do a thing about what's going on. And there's a difference between putting yourselves in a position to where you're around family that are living uh, as the lost because they are lost, and yet you intentionally place yourself there, you keep yourself there, you don't have any issue with it whatsoever, then good luck getting the, even those proximity blessings from God. Why? Because you are knowingly going against the word of God by knowingly bedding down with the world. There is a difference. We have a choice to make as to the way that we're going to live our lives. And the reason why it is, it is so important for us to allow God to show us these things is this. People are watching us. People are watching us. Parents, your kids are watching your life. They are not paying attention to what you say, they are paying attention to what you do. Our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we are watching each other, aren't we? Yes, yes we are. Amen. We are. I'm watching you. You're watching me. We're seeing how the other lives. Now, here's the thing. Am I to judge my character by your character? No. Who am I supposed to judge my character by? The character of Jesus Christ. That is supposed to be who we're supposed to go toward and strive toward being like, is like our Lord, our God, and our Savior. If I simply base my character upon yours, and I think, hey, if I'm living an okay life compared to you, then I'm a good Christian. Why? Because look at you. You hardly come to church. When you're in church, you don't dress like you're going to church. When you're in church, you act like you don't want to be in church. When you're in church, you don't want to fellowship with anybody. You know, it's just like you flat out don't want to be here. So, you know, so long as you keep on coming and I can keep seeing you coming, that's going to make me feel so good about me. Why? Because when I'm in church, I dress like I'm coming to church. When I'm in church, I act like I want to be in church. When I'm in church, I fellowship with everybody. So that makes me a better Christian than you. There's no amens to that. That's because that is a lie from the pits of hell. Here's where we oftentimes get it mixed up. We think, so long as I'm doing okay with most things, I'm doing okay as a Christian. So long as I've got these big things out of my life, I'm okay as a Christian. So long as I don't talk like that person talks, I'm okay as a Christian. So long as I don't smoke or, or, or chew or dip, then I'm okay as a Christian. So long as the things in my refrigerator are non-alcoholic, then I'm okay as a Christian. But see, here's the thing. Remember what the Word of God says about when you judge, judge righteously, and, and talks about the speck in the eye, and that we have the beams in our own eye? See, the problem with us judging our own sin is that we don't see what God sees. We don't want to see it. Amen. We don't want to see what's really in our lives. It's easier for us to look at someone who has sins that we don't struggle with and say, Hi, look at that person. Look at that Christian who's struggling. 
Failing, oh, they so need prayer. I'm so going to pray. But all you're doing is puffing yourself up with pride and saying, I'm glad I'm not as bad off as they are. But you know what that other Christian may be thinking? Well, I wish I could be as good of a Christian as that person is. They go to church. It seems like I really enjoy being there. It doesn't look like they have the struggles that I have. But man, I really wish I could develop a close relationship with that person because I really think that God can use them. And I need someone to disciple me, to help me, to lift me up, and to show me the way now that I've been saved because there are some things I flat out don't understand. And there are some things in my life that I flat out don't think that I can overcome on my own. And you know what? They're right. But how is it that we're going to be a disciple and we're going to be able to disciple someone who needs that type of help that God can do through us if we spend all of our time judging them and looking down upon them and making it seem as if they're bad so that makes us good? See, that's where we get it mis mixed up and that's where we mess up as Christians is that we spend too much time looking at everybody else and too little time allowing God to show us ourselves. Amen. And that's all it comes down to. If you and I were to get along with God regularly and get into his word and I, I, I mean seriously get along with God and get into his word I'm not just saying this to be saying this get along with God and get into his word and ask him to show you what you need to see God is not going to leave you wanting if you're asking him to show you something that will make you a better Christian for him he will not do that you may say oh brother Steve I've tried that so many times and it's just like I'm not hearing anything from God. It's just like there's nothing going on. Nothing's happening. I just feel like I'm spinning my tires over and over and over again. You know what that's called? That is called a heart problem. Because I can guarantee you one thing right here, right now. God will never let a Christian sit idle on the bench, on the sidelines, and not grow and not do for him. He will never do that. If you are on the bench, you put yourself there. Amen. You know why I say that? Because I've spent quite a few years in my 31 years of being saved on that bench. There have been times in my past to where things started getting uncomfortable, things started getting uneasy for God, the lure of the things that are in this world took precedence in my life, and I intentionally set myself out so that I could say, oh, I guess God's not doing anything with me, so I guess I'll just go do my own thing. God doesn't put a Christian on the bench, folks. We bench ourselves. There's no such thing as an injury that is going to sideline us for the season. Why? Because we serve the great physician, and he will not allow that to happen. Now, there are going to be aches and pains and things that are going to happen to us spiritually and sometimes physically along the way, but understand something. There will never be a moment in your life when God does not want you or will not have you on that playing field doing something for him. You're laid up in a hospital bed, start praying and get along with God and try to be a witness to the people that are around you. You find yourself to where you're no longer able to, to drive back and forth from place to place and visit with the people that you visited with. Well, praise God, pick up the phone and start talk, calling people and being a voice of encouragement to them. You get to the point to where you don't think you could come to church anymore because your health's deteriorating and you don't think you could be around your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, praise be to God, because there are places and people that are out there that are trying to reach out to people just like you to be sure you stay active for God and realize, just as Brother Noel preached this morning, until God calls you home, he's not done with you. So you're not done with God unless you choose to put yourself on the bench. The problem is we elect to put ourselves there. Why? Because we want to live how we want to live. Amen. We want to watch the things on TV that we want to watch on TV. Amen. We want to listen to the music we want to listen to. Amen. We want to talk about our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ the way we want to talk about them. We want to badmouth the pastor, badmouth the preacher, badmouth the missionary, badmouth the person who sang the special. So that's why we put ourselves on the sidelines so that God can't expect anything of us while we're acting up and behaving and, be, and behaving like something that is unbecoming of a follower of Jesus Christ. We do that intentionally. And we live our lives the way we want. And then we wonder why things are lacking. And as parents, we wonder why it is that our kids grow up the way that they grow up. We wonder why it is that they're out living like they're not even saved, which I hope that they are saved. Only, only, only the person in Jesus Christ knows whether or not someone's saved. But let me tell you something. You, by their fruit, ye shall know them. And we can look at the life of someone, and there are some people that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they are saved. 
But there are some people you look at them and you're not so sure, are you? I know, it, it, it's hard because you want to convince yourself, well, maybe they're just gotten away from God. Maybe they're just not being as faithful to Him as they need to be. Either that or maybe they were never close to God in the first place. Either that or maybe they just never have accepted Him as their Savior. They know. And God knows. All we can do is pray for them and live our lives in a way that is glorifying to God. Because the Bible also tells us about not being a stumbling block to the weaker brother. Now this really comes into play when you're talking about those that are newly converted, those that are, that are newly born again Christians, those that are young in their faith. Okay? The Bible talks about abstaining from all appearance of evil. Okay, now what's that saying? It's not just saying abstain from all evil. No, 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 no. It's not just saying stay away from the things that are evil. It's saying stay away from things that might to someone Amen. appear as being evil. Amen. Now what that means is don't go to the same theaters that these other people go to. Don't go to the same concerts Amen. that the people that are on their way to hell are going to. Amen. You know, don't go and do the things that the people that are out there do. If you've got a restaurant that says bar and grill, this is just my personal conviction. You're not going to find me there. You know why? I may be there for the bar or I may be there for the grill, but if you see me walk in, unless you're sitting right beside me watching me, you're not going to know one way or the other. And that's just me. That's my conviction. Because it all comes down to abstaining from all appearance of evil. And this is what it comes down to. There's no steak and no incredibly over-seasoned and over-salted food like those places serve that is going to be worth more to me than the soul of someone who sees me go in there and how Satan may use that to turn them the other way. Or a weaker Christian, as Satan may see, allow them to see me going into a place like that or doing something like that, and they say, wow, that's Brother Steve from church. I, I didn't really figure I'd see him in a place like that. And you know how the devil works, don't you? Those cogs start turning in that head. I wonder if he's doing this. I wonder, and they pictured me over there at the bar laughing it up, popping shots with the guy next to me. And I may have just gone in there to uh, go in and, and get a, a, food, a meal to go to take home and eat and spend time with my wife. They don't know that. I do, but they don't. You don't. Yeah, let's just put it this way. If you see me doing something that is questionable, what are you always going to err on the side of? The questionable. Why? Because that's our human nature. We're always going to assume the worst. You know what they say? Assume the worst, hope for the best. Well, it all comes down to the way people perceive our lives. The way people see our lives. It is not important how you see the story of your life. What is important is how others do. And what is most important is how God does. Because if you want to get an idea of how others see you, I challenge you to do this, but don't do it with a light heart. If you want to get an idea of how others truly see you, get along with God and ask Him to show Him how, ask God to show you how He sees you. And boy, I tell you what, it'll put you in your place. Because there's not a single one of us that are near as godly or near as Christ-like as we like to think that we are. We are far from it. And it takes God allowing us to see that, not to bring us down, but to just show us how, how awesome His glory and His power and His righteousness and His holiness is compared to the poor, wretched, sinful worm that I am, how great He is and how nothing I am. And then that is a heart that God can take and tender. And he can take and mold and shape. But you know what? So long as we see ourselves as being, I'm a good Christian, don't ever look at yourself like that. And I, I'm being serious. Again, you remember like what I said before. I don't use the term Christian how other people do. I'm talking about someone who says that you're a Christian, and they call you that, wonderful, okay? But don't say to yourself, I'm a good Christian. You know what? Let me just put it this way. There's no such thing as a good Christian. We are born-again believers in Jesus Christ, and the only thing that is good within us is Him. Amen. There is a good Savior. What was that, brother? There is none good. There is none good. No, not one. And that includes all of us. 
Because how we live, it, what it does to those that are around us, it demonstrates the redeeming and the transforming power of Jesus Christ to those that are watching. Because the redeeming power of Christ happens at the point of salvation. We are redeemed. We are saved. We are swept up from the, the clutches of hell. And our name is written into that Lamb's book of life. And we are forever saved. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the redeeming, the redeeming power, the redemption. The transforming power is the part that Jesus Christ has in our life to where he starts changing us. He takes us. He refines us by placing us into the fire. He takes us and he allows us to go through some storms in our lives to open our eyes to things that otherwise we would not have seen. He takes us and allows us to be brought down low on our face and on our knees before his holiness so that we can recognize the sin in our lives and the iniquity that needs to be removed. That is the transforming power. So the question that I have for you tonight is this. Thus far, what is the story of your life saying to the people that are around you? Is the transforming and redeeming power of Jesus Christ an amazingly powerful and indescribable thing? Or is it just no big deal? Because see, for too many of us, the testimony that we have, the story our life is telling is just like, eh, take it or leave it. It's no biggie. And this is probably going to smack a few in the head, and I, I hope that it does. 